I am Savannah. Um, my colleague won't be joining us, but she's also moving. So Savannah, no H. I gave the H to Sherry. So. <laughs> we are both from Writer, and we'll get into that. This is an introduction to AI red teaming. Um, raise your hand if you have experience with AI or machine learning, or at least with interest. Yeah, perfect. Okay. I'll be using AI and ML and machine learning interchangeably. They're not the same, but just for the sake, I'll stop that <laughs> Yeah, cool. So this is an overview of what's going on. Um, I keep it very light with my machine learning overview, not getting into the math, just enough to understand like what <coughs> you need to be doing the teaming or understanding the vulnerabilities for the systems. This is the exercise. Um, sorry, I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Um, I don't have Twitter, but you're I just like yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Has anyone used Google Notebooks for code? What? Google Notebooks, what this is? What is Google Notebooks? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Collabs. Collabs, yeah. Um, once in a lifetime, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of machine learning researchers use Jupyter Notebooks. So this is like the equivalent mm -hmm. we used for today. There used to be a study in the Collab Notebooks. You could have a kitty running along the top. Oh, well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just FYI. Okay, we might have to get your expertise later. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so I dropped that in there. Um, as you're running it, if there's a pop-up that says, this is not authorized by Google, it's fine, we authorize it. Um, you're all good there. So this is our team here. Um, we call ourselves the Wolf Pack. This is our art here. It's like the cry, uh, like cry wolf um, themed to that. MITRE is um, not-for-profit, does a lot of research and development for different environmental organizations. We operate federally funded research and development centers across aviation, healthcare, security, cybersecurity, um, et cetera. So we, um, our group in particular specializes in AI. So different um, sponsors will come to us, governmental sponsors will come to us and say, hey, what's the deal with AI for this application, this application, like, what, what is AI? Um, oh, okay. So we're going to buff out some prototypes and see what we can do. And so this work is um, some of the, just a, a baseline of what um, machine learning uh, security looks like. So there's machine learning applied to cyber um, tracks. And I think there was another talk um, about applying it to binary analysis. This is how do we apply our red teaming hats to machine learning systems. Okay, who knows what a red team is? Yeah. Like, give us an overview. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah. The part of the offensive team that uh, tries to get into the system either through, you know, with no knowledge or some knowledge, uh, depends on the company, but uh, it basically behaves as if it's the attacker. Uh, but, but not going to compromise the company in any sense. But getting to those limits where uh, you can identify how how deep you can go or how yeah. deep the rabbit hole goes. Right. Exactly. So you have your developers, the yellow team that have the system, and you have red team that's attacking that system so that you're aware of what those vulnerabilities are so that your blue team can then put up defenses. And then the cycle continues. Now that there are more defenses, there's more for the red team to try to get around and show uh, what are the ways that the system is vulnerable. And the link is still up there. Okay, 
why do we do this? Well, obviously we know that AI machine learning, et cetera, is getting very popular, very ubiquitous. You're gonna use it um, in your spam filter, in your email, like in, when you're using Snapchat to text your face, it's everywhere. So we need to understand what are the inherent risks in the data collection, processing of that data, storing of that data, and how it's being deployed. So AI red teams simulate adversaries to try and break these systems. Okay, so this is the example I want you to keep in mind for a little exercise. Um, it's a system that, uh, say you're cashing your check with um, like a mobile picture of your check and it'll get deposited into your bank account. So this is a computer vision system. Um, and we'll just keep that in mind that we're trying to get the computer to read the wrong amount. Okay, so in the notebook, we're going to run the early cells here. And that's the problem I was talking about. These first ones are um, just to get us set up in our notebook. Um, I'm sorry if I'm like kind of just glossing over them. It's more for uh, the presentation's sake. Are all the ones that are in section zero? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, and then, yes, to think like a red teamer, we first need to understand the system. And so this is kind of the yellow teamwork, setting up the system before we break it. So I'll break it. <laughs> okay, and then we're going to set up the data set map next because machine learning is just, um, you're trying to recognize patterns in the data, so you need a data set to work with. Uh, so this is going to be loading up um, the GPU. This is using Google's hardware, so it doesn't matter if you have a GPU or not. Um, fabulous. And then 1.1 is setting up the training data. So it, it is learning like what like the check what the check looks like, or is it learning like like how how it works? Or we're gonna get to that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna show you the data first. Mm. So the data set is. Um, handwritten digits, zero through nine. And we can look at this and be like, that's a seven. Mm. But a computer just sees a bunch of pixels and an image. And so it actually has to learn that that's associated with the seven, digital seven. So this is a series of um, the MNIST data set are a bunch of these samples of different digits. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, now we have the image and then the associated label. The label is a seven, obviously. What is that? You just look at, how do you see the number? You know, yours might be running still if you go to 1.3.0. Oh, that's the one I just ran. Yeah, you have to run everything before it first though. Like this 1.1 downloads it and then. So you're like called, like kind of scraped like how the seven is written and then like, let the machine learn the seven. Yeah. Right. Oh, there. Okay. And then here's a bunch of more samples. Okay. Now we're setting up that model. Uh, you know, you started to talk about there. Uh, this is a neural net. It's uh, specifically a convolutional neural net. What you want to understand here is that the input layer is um, 28 by 28, and that is associated with the pixel size of that image, 28 by 28 image, goes in, there's these hidden layers that is a bunch of matrix map that gets applied to that. Um, and you can think of it as like dials on a box that can change and activate different parts of the image. So your final activation, your final output layer is um, a vector of zero through nine of activations. Um, essentially like how confident it is in each uh, it being that output number. So if it thinks that it's a one, the one um, entry might be a higher confidence, might be like 0.7, and then the other ones are all like under 0.1, for example. And so it would then say, I'm most confident in this being one. So it's like the idea behind that. Um, I recommend doing a tutorial or something on the CNN so if you're curious. Um, oh, I think I just was going so this will build our model. So we talked about. It's gonna kick that one off. Okay, now we're on 
So this is actually pushing that input image through. Um, it's also called forward propagation, if you care about the language like that. Um, so we're gonna kick that off. Okay, what's happening here is that our model is not trained. It is an infant. It does not know anything about the world. It's just making random guesses. So in red here, this is the true label, it's a three. Uh, the blue ones are what it's predicting, what the output is. And it's just, it thinks it's everything. It's just randomly set right now to apply a, a bunch of matrix um, multiplications to it that are essentially random. So it doesn't know anything about the world. So when I run it, I get like a five, that's normal, right? <laughs> yeah, it'll be a randomized, okay. yeah. Cool, now we get to have two different um, looks at that. Okay. So when it like say like it said oh I, I is it three and then you'll tell him oh yeah he's three like it will get an answer or like how did it know like it is the right thing? it will have to get trained um, yeah well, we're gonna do that next if you run two point two point one what's the um, confidence that you're getting or how often is it correct right now out of all the samples that it's seen it's only eight percent accurate so it's really bad right now. The model outputs the correct label 9.47. Okay, 9.7, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna need to uh, define this function called loss so that we can start telling it how wrong it, it is. Um, okay. I'm also gonna do this one, and I'm gonna explain it in a second. This guy is a longer one. <laughs> Leave that up while we're talking about it. So now this is what you were saying. We're going to train the model. So this is presenting it a series of the numbers and then the correct label. And then by doing this repeatedly, it's able to then compute the difference between what it thought it was and what the real label was. And by doing that, it then does this thing called back propagation, which then updates the weights in the middle so that it can get closer to that over time. Um, <laughs> So we're watching it get better over time as it's being presented more and more. It going down means that it's getting less and less wrong. Yeah, this is loss. So loss is the same thing as error, same thing as um, how wrong it was. So in this case, it's a Euclidean distance between the output vector that it gave and then the correct label. And um, Back propagation is essentially a way for us to nudge the weights in a way that makes it perform uh, more accurately away from the loss. Oversimplification, but that's the gist. So the target here is three. You see that it's getting closer and closer to a point where it's converged to a place where it's um, doing it most of the time. How long does this run? How long does this run? <laughs> it is interesting how it is like like calculating how like how it is less and less wrong but instead of like how is it like like more and more right is it is there like a reason for that or like it is just because it's figuring it? out um what what numbers to multiply by to get the correct answer so it's if it's getting continuously nudged in the direction of that gives it less error over time. So if someone was like, you know, every time you, you said someone's name wrong or something and mm. then they correct you and they correct you, then you like shift in your brain how to now, you have that association stronger. Got it. I guess like giving an example for like a human is kind of hard because of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How is it like how is the error getting nudged? Like how is the loss by like somebody has to like okay, you have to manually set it to make it slow down. And then you said like how do you how do you adjust the loss? Like how do you know what they're actually going to do? Yeah, so um are you familiar with like calculus and gradients? Yeah. Um Essentially, create, uh, computing the gradient for which direction to move certain of um, those weights okay. in the middle layers. 
Yeah. Back propagation is what you want to Google if you want to learn from. Cool. So this is the what I just explained here. You're passing the input data through the model. It's going to guess two. The label says no, it's a three. You get some error from that. That error gets propagated back through the network so that the weights can be adjusted in a way like tuning the weights um, towards different numbers to um, move that loss in the right direction. Yes. So this is our back propagation explanation here. Um, I got a like a point oh two six. Oh yeah, what is your accuracy to three point two? Okay, this is all dandy, but this is doing this on data that it was trained on. How does it do on data it's never seen before? So we want to know how well is the model generalizing? And that's what we did here. So the test set is something that we held out so that when it's training, we have data that's left over that's never seen before. And this looks like it's doing well. It's generalizing very well. Um, what numbers are you getting? For the 97.51. Cool. Oh, sorry, that's the number for, um... oh yeah, no worries. Okay, this one's a fun one. This is 2.5.0. This actually lets you see, um, draw an example. So it's obviously never seen this before because we're creating it. Uh, what number do you want to see? Six. Just so quick. <laughs> oh, nice. I was going to say four. <laughs> I got it! Four. Yeah. But you can draw four like this, which looks almost like a nine if you leave the top off. You want me to draw four? I don't know. It thinks my four is a six. Uh oh. You don't have to oh, you're right. Yeah. 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 Okay, how else do, what else do we want to try? Let's try it right here. Well, you can also draw four with leaving the top open. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, this is a six. Yeah, like that's not a great four. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, my four's bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, what if I'm just like, what is that? Tell me that is. I'm <laughs> very <laughs> happy with that. Four. What is it now? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah, if you just hit the play again. Yeah. Yeah, so we're getting an idea of how we might confuse the model here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we put in the 20 for an example here, and I thought it was a four. Okay, model straight, and we break it. Yes, we've already started to look at that. <coughs> so, um, we're exposing some weaknesses in that underlying AI process, so we're going to try to erode the efficacy and just break it. Okay, back to that example. So, what if the check is altered in a way so the computer reads it wrong, but humans can't detect it? So it looks like the normal number, but the algorithm itself underlying is reading it wrong. Okay, so we actually will alter the image itself to make it look more like a, a, a number <coughs> that we want it to be. So before we were updating the model to minimize the loss, remember we were um, the inner layers, we we're updating that. Now we're actually going to update the image itself because as, as an adversary, that's what we have control over. We can't assume that we have access, direct access to the model. Sure. We just have what we're going to give to it, what we're going to show it, what we're going to input into the model. And so we're actually going to do the same type of loss um, process for the image itself. Our setups. Yes. Okay. So for this loss function, it takes in um, the image and the label. So if we're just going to give it to a fake label and then optimize it about that, 
that's going to cause some problems. Sorry, there was a section. Are you getting this here? Nope. Okay, it's doing the thing for me. Is it optimizing the image? Um, so what happens in this section is that we're changing certain pixels in the image. Sorry. We're changing different pixels in the image so that we're activating certain parts of the image that are making the uh, model more inclined to think it's the wrong number. So we're going to be making activating in a way that looks nothing like a 7 in this case for us, but it will... Um, activate the model layers in a way that uh, is not correct. Why would the code be different on this line? Um, I got a, uh, like I froze mine, I put it in playground mode. Oh, okay. So <laughs> um, there might have been just like a change that happened um, accidentally and it got saved. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are welcome to come see the changed image up here. I am not going to try to do that something live. Um, I'll take it back over here. So this is what it looks like. Um, you can see it's like a little fuzzed, but we wouldn't, if you saw this, you'd probably just think it's a three. The confidence is very high that it is a seven, unfortunately, because we went through this process of computing, um, optimizing it towards that by changing the pixels. So congratulations, you deposited $700 in your bank account instead of 300. What you can do next with this is um, there's Another example in this notebook with, that uses ImageNet, and ImageNet is a wider amount of images. What we looked at was just handwritten digits, but you can look at things like toasters and anything. It's a very big data set. Um, or you can expand into different types of data besides just images. Um, and there's this process called expectation over transformation. It's another type of attack that adds robustness and can actually be carried out into the real world. So if I was holding up a sign, uh, um, autonomous vehicle, for example, like that's a common application that you see for that type of attack. So what's at stake? Um, we looked at banking. What other examples could there be for this type of attack? Healthcare. Sorry? Healthcare. Yeah. I have some listed. I just don't know if they're in that order. So I'm going to do anything else? Autonomous cars. Yeah, for sure. Schools and government, because okay. lately they've been attacked and they're holding the, like in Oakland, you know, they hold the dead hostage. <laughs> and now some employees are suing. So yeah. yeah. They're going to pay tax because the, yeah, someone stole the money. It was pretty, yeah, pretty bad. Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. Federal Reserve, that would be it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which is a bank, but you know. Yeah. I think even biometrics in some way, uh, yeah. or you know, mm -hmm. uh, photo detection, you know, whatever technology mm -hmm. uh, that can be hacked some way. Right. Um, okay. The banks, cars, medicine, surveillance, um, ID, identification, aviation. Um, so in our team, when we're thinking about um, assuring AI, make sure that it's 
Shakir, like a, <laughs> it's um, fair and unbiased, big problem. Um, humans can trust them to make a, uh, an AI or machine learning algorithm to make effective decisions. They're going to have a lot of people that are resistant if we can see that, you know, they're not making decisions um, in a fair, just, and secure way um, and resilient to things like what we're proposing. So this is, um, I come from Miner and we have the attack matrix. Uh, we have expanded this um, and created Atlas, which is a knowledge base of uh, ML tactics, like the one I've shown, but also a lot of other ones. They partner with a lot of industry professionals, um, governments, schools, wherever, where people actually report different attacks they're seeing. So we've been doing a lot of like chat GPT based ones lately, um, et cetera. So yeah, I would encourage you to check out because you can see there's already a lot in here. Um, yeah. Okay. And my background was not in security. I just studied computer science. Um, this is a very collaborative field. Uh, we need people that have experience with data, privacy, security, software. Um, so really there's a lot that goes into an AI routine um, and having these different hats that you could put on is essential. Yes, like I said, there's no recipe for working in this field. It's so new. Um, these are my takeaways. When I came to MITRE, I got exposed to security a lot and I also had had some experience with machine learning. So it was a very natural fit for me. Um, and I really love machine learning because you can apply it to every field, a lot of um, high impact fields, um, but we do need to make sure that we're using these systems um, in a secure way. So yeah, I encourage you if you have cyber background, if you have interests, um, explore as much as you can because these systems are only getting bigger, just we've seen. Cool, good questions. Do you have any resources for getting started in understanding uh, use for the basic fundamentals of AI and machine learning uh, with an interest in, in exploring how this works in the career and security operating Yeah, there's a lot of good um, free courses for machine learning. In terms of machine learning and AI, um, probably not one of like academic papers, but there are like the like adversarial patch papers that are um, kind of the bread and butter when people come to our team, we're like, read these. Okay. Um, would it be helpful if I put some resources in the chat later? I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks for your interest. In the, in the Slack chat, right? Not the, I don't, yeah, chat, because I don't need okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're in San Diego? Um, I will be. Yeah. What do you mean? I was at Bedford. We have a campus in Bedford. Um, Virginia? Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have our headquarters in Virginia. We're a 10,000 person company right now, so we have a lot of Oh, right, it's that big? Yeah. yeah. When I started, it was like 6,000. So there's no, your company is actually centered in Virginia, but I thought that San Diego was really the campus because they, on the website, often says that. Which website? The mutual website often talks about oh, that. That's no, um, the headquarters is definitely um, both the one that's near Boston and the one in um, McLean, Virginia. So there it goes a good site. <coughs> it's not that HP. Yeah. It's not that one. It's not like the headquarters. Oh, okay. It's just like a satellite then? Yeah. But we have, we have a lot of people in our department there, so. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, before you like, um, you say you study like computer science, right? Like, were you like also already focused in like machine learning, or you like or learn it after you had the jobs, and now you can also you know learn on the job as well? Yeah, um, I had it in two internships that I used machine learning, so I brought that to my career. The department I entered was like cyber, and I hadn't had cyber background, so I learned that on the job. But I brought some of the machine learning skills. Really cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the demo, guys. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to open later. I'm sure I'll like figure this out right after this, but <laughs> <laughs> that's usually how it works, right?